Turn our hearts and our mind. Is this not turn the ready? But let us come together in one accord. Our oh, Heavenly Father, our oh Lord, I thank you for this night. I thank you for this good news that that, be, that came into our ears and our hearts, Lord. That that's a reason, that's why we're here, Lord. We're here because ah, uh, yeah, we seek your goodness, we seek your honor, we we need we need your word, we need your fellowship, Lord, to um, continue to remind us about who we are and who you are, Lord, who we are in you. But I thank you for who you are, your faithfulness, your your every, everything that you are bless us with, Lord. So I just pray for everyone here, all our ears and our hearts that are um, going to be joining us tonight. I just pray that we be blessed by your spirit, by your presence, by um, his fellowship. Yeah, Lord, have your way with us. We're here to worship you, Lord. Lord. So, uh, yes, Holy Spirit, show us how to worship. Grab our hearts and show us. And let us just praise the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, you, Lord. <laughs> So this is your night, Lord. We give it to you. In Jesus' name. Jesus. It's the reason why we're here. Amen. Amen. Yeah. 
be empty so I can be there Oh, dear. 
Salvation is here. We have done it already, Lord. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for what you have done and what you continue to do. Since then on, that you, you intercede forever for those who have received salvation. That we are never alone. Even when we're not, even when we're not where we're supposed to be, our, our heart is turned now to you, Lord. You are. You pray for us. You intercede. Your grace is there for us. <laughs> Lord, we teach us, Lord. Change our hearts. Change our mind. Teach us how that looks in this world. In our faith. Amen. Amen. Oh, are you guys going to say amen to that?
Announcements. So upcoming events this week. Um, so we usually have the we do have the men's Bible study on Tuesday nights at six o'clock right here. Um, there will be no Kiki Church this week, or actually it's actually indefinite um, until further notice. We have no Kiki Church, so that means the Kiki during worship time has to be in here. And parents, please supervise your Kiki so. <laughs> keep everybody safe yeah so just maka Allah make sure everybody all good uh, Wednesday we have youth group um, the uh, young adult group sorry the kingdom experience Thursday oh pastor Ryan will not be with us from Wednesday to next week Monday he will be uh, traveling there's some um, some business and worship stuff Next week, Sunday, we do have a board meeting. So if any of you feel moved by the Spirit to, if you feel like getting on the board, because uh, me, Gary, Rodney, Kapua, and Uluhania have been on the board for the, since last year. 
but uh, it's time for um, open up the opportunity for people, you know, other people who want to uh, participate as a board member yeah, for our church. So um, if you guys feel like you guys are moved by the Spirit to jump on the board, um, please let us know. And um, you guys can be a part of that um, process. Um, yeah. And then we'll, don't forget that we also have compassion service on Thursdays. So that's part of the food bank, yeah? We help, we cook over the food bank. And um, Shaks Molokai, we really need the help with cook over. Sometimes food bank, we have short workers, yeah? So it's nice when you get the extra hands. If you guys are busy, yeah? So we usually have uh, breakfast here at eight o'clock on that Thursdays. And we announce a win. Um, so the next one will be on the 19th, um, Thursday 19th at eight o'clock here. And then we usually finish our uh, food bank before 12, if get enough um, hands, yeah. Um, if can, if cannot, cannot, you know, we we'll try our best. Yeah. Uh, this week, Thursday, there's no co-ed Bible study. And yeah, youth group is from 8 30, uh, 6 30 to 8 30. That's on Fridays, and that's um, grades 6 to 12. Okay, so no cakey church. I feel like all our cakeys is accounted for. Okay, and that's it. So, this has been, I don't know about you guys, but it feels to me, it feels like the holiday season just kind of crept up on us. Oh, yes. And then all of a sudden it was Christmas. And all of a sudden it was New Year's. And I feel like so many times this week, I've been saying, it's 2023. Yes. Like I've been saying to other people, it's 2023, can you believe it? And I'm usually met with like, oh, I know fast, yeah. Or like, oh yeah, it's, it's 2023. Um, and so like, I know how holidays are and there's always like a lot of hustle and bustle, but when you feel like you're missing some days or you're missing that cushion, even more so, it's just kind of here and then gone, yeah? Um, a couple weeks ago, we got to spend a lot of time in um, reflection, a lot of time in hope and expectancy in the season of Advent. And so that was a great, great thing that we were able to do because everything just came and went so fast. We were able to be contemplative for like four weeks, you know? Um, but then, you know, Christmas came and Epiphany was on Friday and to us, that's the end of Christmas, you know. But our tree is still up, yeah. I usually try to take the tree down on January 6th. So the tree in our house is usually up until January 6th, but... Um, you celebrate Christmas all year round. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> all the time, all the time. But um, yeah, coming out of this holiday period, even the kids break, it just seems like it was so fast and they're already back at school. So I find myself trying to spend more time with my kids, especially my teenagers. Um, I have one that's gonna be leaving for college in a few months, and it makes me just wanna spend more time with her. Um, but the thing that me and my kids have been doing as of late is watching movies. You know, we're movie buffs. We love movies. Love them. Yeah, yeah, Diamond, yeah. We love movies. Um, but something interesting has been happening. They've been really interested in the movies that I grew up with, yeah? And so usually when I think of the movies that I grew up with, I think of like the Goonies, you know? I think of like all those movies from the 80s. Um, but they're teenagers right now. So I think about the movies that I enjoyed when I was a teenager, and we start watching those. We're watching those movies together, and it's good fun. Um, but they have a lot of questions. And sometimes there are questions that really make me feel old. Yeah. Sometimes there are questions that make me feel like, oh my goodness, you kids would not be able to survive in the 90s. Um, but they have questions about the clothes that the characters are wearing. They have questions about catchphrases that were just automatically in our minds, yeah, in the 90s and the early 2000s. They have questions about some of the language that's being used. They're like, what does that word even mean? You know, like, if I did, what's up? Like, everybody knows what that is, yeah? The youth have no idea. Nobody even looked up over there. They're like, anyways, yeah? But all of us that have lived through the 90s, we know what that is. <laughs> and then they have questions about, like, well, why does everything kind of feel the same? 
Why do all the movies from your time, mom, back from the 1900s, that's what they say, like from that time, why do they all kind of feel the same? I'm like, oh, I don't know. I never noticed that. I never noticed that. But these movies were not made for teenagers of 2023 either. <clears throat> these movies that we grew up on, they were made for a specific audience. For the kids that we were, the teenagers that we were, the young people that we were back then. Yeah. So when I answer them, when I answer these questions that they have, I answer from a place of context. Yeah. I'm providing them with information about how life was all the way back then. What was common knowledge for a young person at the time? And kind of like telling them that the audience was different. It wasn't you guys. You guys are not the target audience. <laughs> this isn't aimed at you. Yeah. So watching some of my old favorites though, I was shocked at how many details I missed as a teenager. You guys ever watch a movie that you're like, oh, I love this movie growing up. And then you watch it as an adult and you're like, oh my. <laughs> I don't remember this scene. Or you, or you hear somebody say something, you're like, that is so inappropriate. <laughs> yeah. I'm just shocked. All the things that I miss. So there's that kind of stuff. But then I also miss the details about the story. I'm shocked at how I watch these movies and then I start to see like, oh, when I watched this back then, I didn't realize the director or the screenplay writer or whatever was foreshadowing something that was coming later. I didn't get that. It just like went by me. I missed the nudges from the director um, foreshadowing those things, but then I noticed like I even missed some of the meanings of the movies that I watched. Some of the stories, some of the scenes. Where when I was younger, I was like, oh, I just like this movie. But now I, when I see it as an adult, I'm like, oh, I know what that means. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's always more to the story than what we remember or what we can see or hear. Yeah. And I think the reason for that is now when I see these movies, I am an older woman now. I have kids now. I've lived life to a certain extent now. I've had more experiences now than I did then. And so it just makes me realize, wow, there was so much more to that story than what I saw in the present. And it makes me think about our spiritual walk. It makes me think about how we look at stories in scripture. It makes me think about how we see stories that we're so used to, stories that we've heard since we were children maybe, and how we probably missed some really important details because we weren't there yet. We haven't lived life yet. We hadn't experienced things yet. Yeah. So watching these movies, I end up having epiphanies. It's like, oh, that makes sense. That's what this whole movie is about. And so this last Friday on the 6th was Epiphany. Yeah. Um, and Epiphany is the story, or this, this revelation yeah, of who Jesus is. It's like, when I hear the word, or when we say the word Epiphany in today's world, it's about a light bulb going off in your head. It's like, oh, that's what it is. Okay, this all connects. This makes sense. So if you have your Bibles with you tonight, we're going to be in the Gospel of Matthew, because we're going to be looking at the Epiphany. Because we can have epiphanies all our lives, but there is the epiphany where there's this realization of who Jesus is. This realization of all the things that the prophets had said up to this point. That it had been manifested, that it had come to earth, that this uh, Messiah, this King of the Jews, had been born. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 2. And we're going to go from chapter 2, verse 1. Hmm. Well, we're going to go all the way to 12, but right now we'll just go to um, Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. Okay, so some of your translations might say wise men, they might say magi. Um, 
You might see a lot of different things. So it says, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is this child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. Verse 3 says, When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. Okay. So first thing we see is um, these people that came from the Far East. <coughs> Call them up. These people that came from, from the east to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? Now, when I was a child and I heard about the three kings and the wise men and all that, um, the only picture that I had in my mind was these three people that were dressed really nicely and they had little fancy boxes and it was just the three of them and they walked or they rode camels and they went to go see baby Jesus in the manger. That was the picture that I had. That was the picture that I got from movies. That was the picture that I got from Kiki Church. That's what I had. That was this story in my mind. Looking at scripture, though, and starting to break things down, starting to look at the details, we see a lot more. We see a lot of things happening here. We see that there were um, wise men from the east coming. It doesn't say that there were three, though. It doesn't say that. We know that there's three gifts, yeah? But it doesn't say that there's only three of them. And then they're asking, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? I always thought that was weird that they would stop off in Jerusalem. Be like, hey, where the baby? <laughs> where, is, where is the king of the Jews? But looking more into the details and more into who these people were, these wise men, uh, we're able to, to find out why they were there, why they even knew about this newborn king. So the Magi were a famous class of astrologers and dream interpreters. Yeah? They were people who read the stars. They would find meaning in the placement and movement of the stars. They would be able to look at stars and tell that a king was about to be born, or a king was born, but they could also look at the stars and tell that a king has died or was going to die. The same is true for the rising and falling of kingdoms. They were astrologers. So they saw this star and they're like, hey, that means the king of the Jews is being born. So of course, if you're looking for the king of the Jews, a newborn baby, you're going to go to the palace. You're going to go where a king would be born. You're going to go, maybe you're going to Herod and be like, hey, you had a baby? Or like, hey, what's going on? Because Herod was the king of the Jews. But so they go to Herod and they say, hey, where's this newborn king? We've come to pay him homage. We saw the stars rising and Herod freaked out. Oh, man. Oh gosh, it says he was frightened and all of Jerusalem with him. And so he didn't tell them that. He didn't tell the wise men, like, oh, this is freaking me out. We ain't got no baby here. Like, he didn't say that. Um, it says instead he went to go inquire with the scribes. He went to go inquire with the people that knew scripture. The people that knew what the prophets had said and said, hey, uh, so there's these guys out here that are saying that there's a king of the Jews, but they don't know where he's born. We don't know where this baby is born. We don't know where this king is. But of course, the chief priests and the scribes that we could also refer to as the Sanhedrin, they were the Jewish council. Um, they're like, oh, yeah, we know where that baby is. We know, we know where that baby is going to be born. It's, it's Bethlehem, you know? It's Bethlehem. It's just like what was written, uh, or it's just like what was, what was said, what was written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Yeah. So these people that the king had um, went to go double check with, they're like, no, yeah, we know where, we know where the baby's gonna be born. Um, and with that information, 
Actually, we'll keep reading. So it says, uh, verse 4, And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written. And then we know what they said after that. Which, of course, he's, um, they're sharing from Micah 5, 2. And then verse 7 in Matthew chapter 2, it says, Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. It says when they had, uh, when they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. So when we see Herod talking to these wise men, we know that he's not being serious. Well, we know that he wants to know where this baby is. We know that it's not to pay him homage. We know that it's not to worship him too, as some of our translations might say. Because uh, we know a few things about Herod. So even his Jewish council, the ones that he was asking, like, hey, where's the baby? Uh, biblical scholars believe that this council that he was inquiring with were a recent council. They were recently put together. Because the council before did not align with him politically, and so he had them killed. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's the way things were with people like Herod. If you don't go along with what they're saying or what they want to do, then they're just going to have to move you out of the way, which we also see with his response to, hey, when you see that baby, when you find him, let me know so I can come. Let me know so I can come see him. Um, and so we see that uh, the wise men, they kept walking. And church, I, I feel like when we're picturing these wise men, and I'm saying this because I'm picturing it also, we're picturing these three people on camels um, with their little boxes, and they all look different, and they're all wearing the same kind of colors and, and clothes that we've seen drawn and, and things like that. But um, the truth of the matter is, if these are famous um, astrologers, if these are people that are carrying with them gold and frankincense and myrrh, very precious items, it is highly unlikely that it would just be three people walking. It's highly unlikely that it would be three people walking through. We don't even know how far it is. Actually, we can probably figure that out. But um, traveling by themselves, it's very unlikely that it would be just the three of them. It's more likely that they're traveling in a caravan, that there's so many people, there's so many camels and animals and all these all, well, maybe just camels, um, traveling with them, yeah, to ensure their safety, yeah, ensure that they get to where they're going. Huh. But there's something interesting that's happening here. And I'll get to that in a second. I'll get to that in a second. Because um, it's a part of those details. It's a part of the things that we've heard the story all of our lives, but we just didn't look at these details, maybe. So it says, when they saw the star had stopped in verse 10, they were overwhelmed with joy. They were so excited, like, oh, the star stopped there. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So there's a few things that happen in this interaction that makes us try to play it in our minds um, where these wise men were really from, if they're kneeling, the way that they're kneeling, the kind of gifts that they have. We might try to figure out exactly what country they originated from. Um, but the main thing from this story with these three wise men, or these wise men, yeah, these people, um, is that they got to experience God in the flesh. They got to experience God in the flesh. They used their context of stars. They used the things that they knew to find God in the flesh. But they couldn't do it alone. They couldn't do it alone. They used the context. They used the tools that they had, and it brought them to Jerusalem. 
And when it brought them to Jerusalem, it brought them to a person that we could, that we could describe as evil, you know, because we know that after this, Herod is going to call for um, a, a slaughter of babies to and under. But it, the star brought them to Jerusalem that brought them to Herod. And Herod brought the scribes and the chief priests information of the baby being in Bethlehem. And because of all of these things, because of all of these interactions, they got to experience God in the flesh. They got to experience love incarnate. They got to experience Jesus. They got to be there. They got to offer them. They got to offer Jesus their most precious things because of these interactions with other people. And these interactions, church, these were not all positive interactions. We know what Herod said. Hey, tell me what a baby is so I can see the baby too. We know that that's not really what he wanted to do. And in the verse right after that, um, scripture even tells us that they had been warned by a dream to not return to Herod until they left for their own country by another road. So we know that they didn't let Herod know where this baby was, but it was their interaction with Herod that brought them the information of where Jesus was. And I saw that detail. And so often, I think about the interactions that I have with people that are unsavory. <laughs> the interactions that I wish I didn't have to have or the interactions that I wish never happened. And then I see these details. And I'm reminded how God will use everything even the unsavory things, even the words, even the, even the things that, that make that boil our blood yeah, when we think about it. God will use all of these things. It's also a reminder that our walk with Christ, everyone's walk with Christ, starts off with who we believe Christ to be, which is more often than not um, a belief that somebody gave to us, maybe by somebody who loves us, maybe by somebody who brought us to church, maybe by someone who disciples us, or our image of Christ is something that we've seen depicted in um, TV shows or movies. Yeah. But we always start somewhere. We have some sort of context of who Jesus is. And then we can always go deeper. We can always see more. We can always find more. We can always look at the details and say, wow, God, even in my hardest moments, you were there with me? Even in my hardest moments, you were gonna use that? Even in my hardest moments, this was gonna be a reminder that I'm not alone? And so it was, uh, so the Magi, these wise men, these, these people that came afar, they got to experience God um, through people that believed differently than them. They got to experience God uh, out of having conversations that probably made them uncomfortable. They got to experience God by going to places that they wouldn't normally go. And so when I think of these things, church, I think of this word that we love so much, which is community. It's in community that we are met with people that believe differently than us. It's in community that, um, that we might find conflicts with each other. That could be our faith community. That could be right here in this church. We might have conflicts with somebody in this church right now or in this building right now. But it's also in community that it's possible to experience God more fully, more fully than we would on our own. Community births differences of beliefs. Community births conflict. But community brought about the opportunity to experience God for the wise men 
And it also brings about the opportunity to experience God with us. Every time that we gather as a church body, every time that we gather as believers, we experience God. Every time that we open our word and we, and we spend time and we meditate on the scriptures, we experience God. Every time that we sit in silence and solitude and we just wait, we say, Lord, I know that you want to speak to me. I know there's something that you're telling me that I, I'm not hearing. Every time that we pray, every time that we look for the details, we experience God. Yeah. So after these wise men left, we have no idea what happened to them. Yeah. We don't know if they became devout believers in God through the revelation of Jesus. Like, oh, this is the Messiah. Oh, this is the king of the Jews, this little boy. You know, we don't know that. Scripture doesn't tell us that. Um, and scripture doesn't even tell us like, hey, these, these people, they believed in one God. It doesn't even say that. Yeah. It's believed that these wise men were also um, polytheists. So they probably worshiped many gods. Um, yeah, we don't know what happened with the wise men. All that we know from our own testimony is what can happen to a life once you experience God. We don't know if meeting uh, Jesus placed a seed of doubt in the wise men's other belief systems. And we don't know if they kind of had this idea in the back of their mind, like, hmm, maybe, that, maybe there is only one God. Maybe there is. I don't know. Maybe they started to see inconsistencies with their current beliefs. We don't know. But what we do know is that a light appeared. And it was revealing the light of Christ in the world. And that this light of Christ that was present in the world it was a reminder that God is present in our world, that God lives among us, that this God who was previously a God who would utilize prophets to speak and be present was now with us. With the birth of Jesus, we're reminded that God came to this world, this same world that we have abused, this world that we have um, that is filled with people that we either treat poorly with our actions or our words, or we think poorly of them in our thoughts. This world that has systems that tear families apart. Um, we're reminded that this is the same world that God chose to enter because of the love that he has for us, because of the love for humanity. And in it all, we're given hope and peace and joy and love in the midst of all the brokenness. In the midst of it. Yeah. This song, Keep Making Me. Ah, this song is nuts. This song is nuts. That's a song that like, if I sang it around my friends that did not believe in Jesus, they'd be like, what are you singing? Why does a song have those words? <laughs> you know? But it's this, it's this reminder to me, when we sing those words, it's a reminder to me that um, anything that fills us to where we don't feel lonely, to where we don't feel empty, to where we don't feel broken, anything that fills us that is not from God, God, that's from somewhere else, you know? It's from somewhere else. He said, God, make me broken in this world so that you're the one that puts me back together, yeah? God, make me empty. I want, I want my, I just want to be empty of all the things of this world so that you're the one that fills me. I want to be lonely in the world since the, so that it's you, so that it's you that I want, so that it's you, so I know that it's you that I need. And that all comes from this revelation of the presence of God. Yeah. And so we see other places in scripture where God reveals to those present who Jesus is. So the star revealed, hey, Jesus, this is the baby. This is the one. This is the one that you guys have been waiting for. This is the one that's the deliverer. This is the one that's going to do all the things that you have heard about all your lives. He's here. 
And so a light shine, revealing the light of Christ in this world. Today is also um, the baptism of the Lord. So today is also a day that we, um, we usually talk about baptism. Yeah. On Friday, I asked my youth, I said, hey, what do you think baptism is? What is baptism to you? I'll ask, you know, what is baptism to you? Um, and we played some water games and things like that just to get them acquainted with um, how we see water, how water was seen by the Jewish culture at this time. Um, but again, in the baptism of Jesus, a light shined and revealed the light of Christ in this world. In Matthew chapter 3, um, verses 13 through 17, we see Jesus being baptized by John the Baptist. And right before that, John the Baptist is, he's talking about what's going on. He's talking about what it is that he's doing and who's going to come after him. He's talking about all those things. Yeah. Um, but in verses 13 through 17, we see Jesus come to John the Baptist. And it doesn't even say how John knew that this was Jesus. It doesn't even say that. You know, it's not like Jesus is walking around with a name tag, like, hello, my name is Jesus or Yeshua. Like, it's, it, it's not like that's happening. So we don't know how John knew. Um, but we do know that Jesus told him, um, that John told him, um, you're coming to me to baptize you? This should be the other way around. I was just talking about who you are. I was just talking about how great you are, that I'm not even good enough to carry your sandals, which is something that servants did. But I'm not even good, about, I'm not even good enough for that, and you want me to baptize you? It should be the other way around. And Jesus told him, in um, chapter 3, verse 15, it says, But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. It says, Then he consented. So then John the Baptist baptized Jesus. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. For the Lord. And so this is also one of those scenes that's like burned in my memory. Yeah? This interaction between John the Baptist and Jesus. But it's these details. It's these details that change everything. Jesus says something to John the Baptist that I never realized what it is he could be saying. Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. We don't know that if Jesus could have just dunked himself, you know, if that would have been baptized, but he said, no, let it be so now so that um, or it's proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. He used this word, us. He included John in his ministry. He included John in this righteousness. He included John in this mission of God. And so we see this over and over again. There's so many, there's so many stories, church, that I can just talk forever, but I'm not going to talk forever. But I would just encourage us each and every one of us, even after today, this is something that I, I vow to do, um, is to look at these passages that, we're, that we see so much, that we read so much, and look at these passages through the lens of hope, through the lens of peace, of joy, and of love. Sometimes we might look at passages and we might look at them with a lens of, I know what is the right thing to do. Like, I got to tell my kids they need to obey me, so I'm going to look at the passage like that. But what happens if we look at the same scriptures that we've been reading all our lives and we look at them with the lens of hope and peace and joy and love? If we look at them with the lens of who Jesus is. We might see details that we never saw before. There might be a revelation 
in our minds. There might be a light that goes up where we say, oh, this is calling me to something deeper. This is equipping me. This is, this is including me in this ministry. This is including me in being an agent yeah, and being a part of Jesus' ministry instead of just somebody being ministered to. And so Advent that we went through, it was a time of living every day in hope and expectancy and preparing our hearts for the coming of Christ. Yeah. Now we're in Epiphany. Yeah? Epiphany is the time we find ourselves, um, is the time we find ourselves in now up until Lent. But that is a time of exploration and revelation of who Jesus is. So in the same way that we took all this time um, in hope and expectancy in Advent, in this time of Epiphany, I invite you, church, to allow this to be a time of exploration and revelation, to look through the passages, to research the stories, to sit in contemplation, to have a time of prayer, of silence, where we say, Lord, what is it that you're revealing? What is it that I can see in this scripture with the lens of hope and peace and joy and love? And so that would be my encouragement this week, church, is uh, to find those places, that we find those places in our lives where we are so certain of what it is that we're seeing. We're so certain of what something means and instead of looking at it with our own lenses, we look at it through the lens of Jesus. Hope and peace and joy and love. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, um, we love you so much and we thank you for uh, this time that we have to um, be together, Lord, as a family of believers. Lord, we thank you for um, just all that you have done in our lives all that you continue to do in our lives, Lord. We thank you for this time of worship where we're reminded of who you are, Lord, where we're reminded of who we are in you. Lord, in the same way that, um, that epiphanies happen, Lord, I pray each and every one of us here, um, each and every one of us here just finds a, a time and a space where we can reflect, Lord, where we can um, experience you deeply, Lord, where we can um, be free to not have all the answers, Lord. In the same way that the wise men, they probably thought they had all the answers with the stars, Lord, they didn't. Lord, I pray that you just continue to reveal to us each and every day that your enormity, your, um, your love, just who you are is so great that we'll never be at this place where we understand you fully, Lord, but that that's where our faith comes in. That we rest in you, Lord. That we don't have to have all the answers, Lord, but that we sit in exploration and revelation. That we sit ready to hear you. We wait, ready to experience you in our personal lives, Lord, in our relationships, in our interactions. Lord, you are with us, and we feel you with us. We feel you in this place. We feel you in our hearts. Lord, I just pray for my, um, my church family, Lord, that, um, that we are just able to come to this this place of, of surrendering our need to know everything, our need to understand everything, our need for certainty, where we can look to you, Lord, and we know that, that it's in you and it's through you that our lives, Lord, will make sense, that the details will emerge. 
Lord, we know that these moments, in the same way that the onlookers at this baptism that saw all of these things happen, might have been frightened, might have been confused. Lord, us moving into this space of exploration and revelation can be scary. But Lord, we know that you are with us. And we know that it's you who strengthens us, Lord. It's you that beckons us to seek you more, to move deeper, Lord. And so we love you and we just continue to give you this, this night, Lord. I, I pray that we give you um, our lives. But Lord, we love you and we just, um, we just worship you for um, who you are, Lord. And we thank you for using us, using everyone around us in the ways that you see fit. So we love you, we praise you, Lord, and we pray all of this in your name. Amen. We are blessed, church. Anna. Praise you, Lord. We thank you for this good news that even so happened so long ago, but every time we open up your word and read about the testimonies of you of who you are, we we able to get epiphanies of love, and peace, and hope. <laughs> so Lord, we thank you once again. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you.
Thank you.